Stephen Hero. Anyone spoke to him mingled a too polite disbelief with its expectancy. His stiff, coarse, brownish hair was combed high off his forehead, but there was little order in its arrangement. A girl might or might not have called him handsome. The face was regular in feature, and its pose was almost softened into positive, distinct beauty by a small feminine mouth. In a general survey of the face, the eyes were not prominent. They were small, light blue eyes which checked advances. They were quite fresh and fearless, but in spite of this, the face was, to a certain extent, the face of a debauchee. The president of the college was a sequestrated person who took the chair at reunions and inaugural meetings of societies. His visible lieutenants were a dean and a bursar. The bursar, Stephen thought, fitted his title, a heavy, florid man with a black-grey cap of hair. He performed his duties with great unction and was often to be seen looming in the hall, watching the coming and going of the students. He insisted on punctuality, a minute or so late, once or twice. He would not mind that so much. He would clap his hands and make some cheery reproof. But what made him severe was a few minutes lost every day. It disturbed the proper working of the classes. Stephen was nearly always more than a quarter of an hour late. And so when he arrived, the bursar had usually gone back to his office. One morning, however, he arrived at the school earlier than usual. Walking up the stone steps before him was a fat young student. A very hard-working, timorous young man with a bread-and-jam complexion. The bursar was standing in the hall with his arms folded across his chest, and when he caught sight of the fat young man, he looked significantly at the clock. It was eight minutes past eleven. Now then, Maloney, you know this won't do. Eight minutes late. Disturbing your class like that. We can't have that, you know. Must be in sharp for lecture every morning in future. The jam overspread the bread in Maloney's face as he stumbled over some excuses about a clock being wrong and then scurried upstairs to his class. Stephen delayed a little time hanging up his overcoat while the large priest eyed him solemnly. Then he turned his head quietly towards the bursar and said, Fine morning, sir. The bursar at once clapped his hands and rubbed them together and clapped them together again. The beauty of the morning and the appositeness of the remark both struck him at the same time, and he answered cheerily, Beautiful! Fine, bracing morning now! And he fell to rubbing his hands again. One morning Stephen arrived three quarters of an hour late, and he thought it his decenter plan to wait till the French lecture should begin. As he was leaning over the banisters, Waiting for the twelve o'clock bell to ring, a young man began to ascend the winding stairs slowly. At a few steps from the landing, he halted and turned a square, rustic face towards Stephen. "'Is this the way to the matriculation class, if you please?' he asked in a brogue, accenting the first syllable of matriculation. Stephen directed him, and the two young men began to talk. The new student was named Madden and came from the county of Limerick. His manner, without being exactly diffident, was a little scared, and he seemed grateful for Stephen's attentions. After the French lecture, the two walked across the green together, and Stephen brought the newcomer into the National Library. Madden took off his hat at the turnstile, and as he leaned on the counter to fill up the docket for his book, Stephen remarked the peasant's strength in his jaws. The dean of the college was professor of English, Father Butt. He was reputed the most able man in the college. He was a philosopher and a scholar. He had read a series of papers at a total abstinence club to prove that Shakespeare was a Roman Catholic. He had also written against another Jesuit father who had very late in life been converted to the Baconian theory of the authorship of the plays. Father Butt had always his hands full of papers and his soutane very soiled with chalk. He was an elderly greyhound of a man and his vocal ligaments, like his garb, seemed to be coated with chalk. He had a plausible manner with everyone, and was particularly... Two pages missing. 
of verse are the first conditions which the words must submit to. The rhythm is the aesthetic result of the senses, values, and relations of the words thus conditioned. The beauty of verse consisted as much in the concealment as in the revelation of construction, but it certainly could not proceed from only one of these. For this reason, he found Father Butt's reading of verse, and a schoolgirl's accurate reading of verse, intolerable. Verse to be read according to its rhythm should be read according to the stresses, that is, neither strictly according to the feet, nor yet with complete disregard for them. All this theory he set himself to explain to Morris, and Morris, when he had understood the meanings of the terms, and had put these meanings carefully together, agreed that Stephen's theory was the right one. There was only one possible way of rendering the first quatrain of Byron's poem. My days are in the yellow leaf, the flowers and fruits of love are gone. The worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. The two brothers tried this theory on all the verse they could remember, and it yielded wonderful results. Soon Stephen began to explore the language for himself, and to choose, and thereby rescue once for all, the words and phrases most amenable to his theory. He became a poet with malice aforethought. He was at once captivated by the seeming eccentricities of the prose of Freeman and William Morris. He read them as one would read a thesaurus, and made a garner of words. He read Skeet's etymological dictionary by the hour, and his mind, which had from the first been only too submissive to the infant sense of wonder, was often hypnotized by the most commonplace conversation. People seemed to him strangely ignorant of the value of the words they used so glibly, and pace by pace, as this indignity of life forced itself upon him, he became enamoured of an idealising, a more veritably human tradition. The phenomenon seemed to him a grave one, and he began to see that people had leagued themselves together in a conspiracy of ignobility, and that destiny had scornfully reduced her prices for them. He desired no such reduction for himself, and preferred to serve her on the ancient terms. There was a special class for English composition, and it was in this class that Stephen first made his name. The English essay was for him the one serious work of the week. His essay was usually very long, and the professor, who was a leader writer on the Freeman's Journal, always kept it for the last. Stephen's style of writing though it was over-affectionate towards the antique, and even the obsolete and too easily rhetorical, was remarkable for a certain crude originality of expression. He gave himself no great trouble to sustain the boldnesses which were expressed or implied in his essays. He threw them out as sudden defence works while he was busy constructing the enigma of a manner, for the youth had been apprised of another crisis, and he wished to make ready for the shock of it. On account of such manoeuvres, he came to be regarded as a very unequilibrated young man who took more interest than young men usually take in theories which might be permitted as pastimes. Father Butt, to whom the emergence of these unusual qualities had been duly reported, spoke one day to Stephen with the purpose of sounding him. Father Butt expressed a great admiration for Stephen's essays, all of which, he said, the professor of English composition had shown him. He encouraged the youth and suggested that in a short time, perhaps, he might contribute something to one of the Dublin papers or magazines. Stephen found this encouragement kindly meant, but mistaken, and he launched forth into a copious explanation of his theories. Father Butt listened and, even more readily than Morris had done, agreed with them all. Stephen laid down his doctrine very positively and insisted on the importance of what he called the literary tradition. Words, he said, have a certain value in the literary tradition and a certain value in the marketplace. A debased value. Words are simply receptacles for human thought. In the literary tradition, they receive more valuable thoughts than they receive in the marketplace. Father Butt listened to all this, rubbing his chalky hand often over his chin and nodding his head, and said that Stephen evidently understood the importance of tradition. Stephen quoted a phrase from Newman to illustrate his theory. In that sentence of Newman's, he said, the word is used according to the literary tradition. It has there its full value. 
in ordinary use, that is, in the marketplace, it has a different value altogether, a debased value. I hope I'm not detaining you. No, not at all. Not at all. No, no. Yes, yes, Mr. Dedalus, I see. I quite see your point. Detain. The very morning after this, Father Butt returned Stephen's monologue in kind. It was a raw, nipping morning, and when Stephen, who had arrived too late for the Latin lecture, strolled into the physics theatre, he discovered Father Butt kneeling on the hearthstone, engaged in lighting a small fire in the huge grate. He was making neat wisps of paper and carefully disposing them among the coals and sticks. All the while he kept up a little patter, explaining his operations, and at a crisis he produced from the most remote pockets of his chalky soutin three dirty candle butts. These he thrust in different openings, and then looked up at Stephen with an air of triumph. He set a match to a few projecting pieces of paper, and in a few minutes the coals had caught. There is an art, Mr. Dedalus, in lighting a fire. So I see, sir. A very useful art. That's it, a useful art. We have the useful arts, and we have the liberal arts. Father Butt, after this statement, got up from the hearthstone and went away about some other business, leaving Stephen to watch the kindling fire, and Stephen brooded upon the fast-melting candle butts and on the reproach of the priest's manner till it was time for the physics lecture to begin. The problem could not be solved out of hand, but the artistic part of it at least presented no difficulties. In reading through Twelfth Night for the class, Father Butt skipped the two songs of the clan without a word, and when Stephen, determined on forcing them on his attention, asked very gravely whether they were to be learned by heart or not, Father Butt said it was improbable such a question would be on the paper. The clown sings these songs for the duke. It was a custom at that time for noblemen to have clowns to sing to them for amusement. He took Othello more seriously and made the class take a note of the moral of the play, an object lesson in the passion of jealousy. Shakespeare, he said, had sounded the depths of human nature. His plays show us men and women under the influence of various passions, and they show us the moral result of these passions. We see the conflict of these human passions, and our own passions are purified by the spectacle. The dramas of Shakespeare have a distinct moral force, and Othello is one of the greatest of tragedies. Stephen trained himself to hear all this out without moving hand or foot, but at the same time he was amused to learn that the president had refused to allow two of the boarders to go to a performance of Othello at the Gaiety Theatre on the ground that there were many coarse expressions in the play. The monster in Stephen had lately taken to misbehaving himself and on the least provocation was ready for bloodshed. Almost every incident of the day was a goad for him and the intellect had great trouble keeping him within bounds. But the episode of religious fervour, which was fast becoming a memory, had resulted in a certain outward self-control, which was now found to be very useful. Besides this, Stephen was quick enough to see that he must disentangle his affairs in secrecy, and reserve had ever been a light penance for him. His reluctance to debate scandal, to seem impolitely curious of others, aided him in his real indictment, and was not without a satisfactory flavour of the heroic. Already, while that fever fit of holiness lay upon him, he had encountered, but out of charity had declined, to penetrate disillusioning forces. These shocks had driven him from breathless flights of zeal shamefully inwards, and the most that devotional exercises could do for him was to soothe him. This soothing he badly needed, for he suffered greatly from contact with his new environment. He hardly spoke to his colleagues, and performed the business of the class without remark or interest. Every morning he rose and came down to breakfast. After breakfast he took the tram for town, settling himself on the front seat outside with his face to the wind. He got down off the tram at Amiens Street Station instead of going on to the pillar, because he wished to partake in the morning life of the city. This morning walk was pleasant for him, and there was no face that passed him on its way to its commercial prison, but he strove to pierce to the motive centre of its ugliness. 
It was always with a feeling of displeasure that he entered the green and saw on the far side the gloomy building of the college. As he walked thus through the ways of the city, he had his ears and eyes ever prompt to receive impressions. It was not only in Skeet that he found words for his treasure house. He found them also at haphazard in the shops, on advertisements, in the mouths of the plodding public. He kept repeating them to himself till they lost all instantaneous meaning for him and became wonderful vocables. He was determined to fight with every energy of soul and body against any possible consignment to what he now regarded as the hell of hells. The region, otherwise expressed, wherein everything is found to be obvious. And the saint, who formerly was cherry of speech, in obedience to a commandment of silence, could just be recognised in the artist who schooled himself to silence, lest words should return him his discourtesy. Phrases came to him, asking to have themselves explained. He said to himself, I must wait for the Eucharist to come to me. And then he set about translating the phrase into common sense. He spent days and nights hammering noisily as he built a house of silence for himself, wherein he might await his Eucharist. Days and nights gathering the first fruits and every peace offering, and heaping them upon his altar, whereon he prayed clamorously the burning token of satisfaction might descend. In class, in the hushed library, in the company of other students, he would suddenly hear a command to be gone, to be alone, a voice agitating the very tympanum of his ear, a flame leaping into divine cerebral life. He would obey the command and wander up and down the streets alone, the fervour of his hope sustained by ejaculations until he felt sure that it was useless to wonder any more, and then he would return home with a deliberate, unflagging step, piecing together meaningless words and phrases with deliberate, unflagging seriousness. In the manuscript, end of first episode of V is written in red crayon at this point.